Hi, I'm Hank Hallowell, and welcome to the AACA Museum. Today, we're going to talk about the Chrysler Imperial, and more specifically, just the Imperial alone. Um, the Chrysler Imperial uh, was a nameplate that Chrysler used beginning in 1926 and introduced as the Imperial 80. It was called the Imperial 80 because it went 80 miles an hour, which was a lot of speed in 1926, let me tell you. So Chrysler was known as the engineering company because they put a lot of effort behind advanced engineering for their cars, whether it was floating power or something else they were known for, which was really the rubber engine mount, but made a big difference in the 20s, four-wheel four -wheel brakes, um, the first car with power steering. Um, these don't sound like a big deal today, but at the time as these, these, these um, modernized engineering advances occurred, Chrysler was usually at the forefront. By 1954, Chrysler decided to launch the Chrysler Imperial as just a standalone um, division, automobile division and brand, and be, be, just became known as the Imperial. This is a 1955 Imperial, the first year of what would, ha what would become a five generation uh, span of automobiles. All very specially built with really the best of everything that Chrysler could put in an automobile. That meant that it was the most advanced engineering they could come up with, the best ride, the, mo the nicest interiors, the uh, uh, really very carefully assembled vehicles almost by hand, and it was advertised as America's most carefully built car. It was also, they used the phrase, the incomparable Imperial. Um, America's most distinguished automobile. So it was built on its own production line for many of its years and on a much slower production line. So more care could go into its manufacture. Uh, in 1954, Chrysler borrowed $100 million from the insurance industry and came out with the $100 million look, which was its 1955 car line. And it was an all new look for Chrysler. And they were ready for a new look because at they had been America's number two auto manufacturer, but they'd been passed by Ford, and largely because their styling really lacked and fell behind the other manufacturers. Not that there was anything wrong with it, but it was tall and humpy and lumpy, and people wanted streamlined, mid-century modern looking cars. So Virgil Exner was hired from Studebaker Corporation, where he'd worked under Raymond Lowy to produce the uh, famous post-war, first, first post-war car, the Studebaker 1947 uh, automobile and the famous Starlight Coupe. Um, and he came to Chrysler and produced a set of idea cars built by Ghia, built it by hand by Ghia in Turin, Italy, and then shipped to the United States for the show car circuit. Probably the most well-known generation of those cars was the famous dual Ghia, but that's a story for another time. 1955 was the first opportunity for Virgil Exner to really show his ability, and this is what he produced. A fabulous, uh, beautiful car by any stretch of the imagination, uh, powered by Chrysler's fabulous uh, 331 cubic inch Hemi engine, first introduced in 1951 but not coupled with a fully automatic transmission really until 19, the end of 1953 and really the first 1954 full model year with the Chrysler PowerFlight transmission. And it's a fabulous two-speed, trouble-free transmission, almost indestructible, just like the Torque Flight, which followed it in 1956. Um, this car is on its own exclusive 133 inch wheelbase and to give you an idea what that means a later Chrysler Imperial that we're going to look at a little later is on a, on a 127 inch wheelbase so 133 is a long way between wheels and when you turn a corner with this you need lots of space um, uh, but it provides you with a fabulous ride uh, incredible smooth handling and with that 331 Hemi and the um, Chrysler automatic transmission, 
a just a great driving experience. People bought these cars and they never sold them. This was the purchase of a lifetime for many people. Um, the car has all of the famous Exner styling cues, including the famous microphone taillights, which you'll see in a minute, and uh, uh, an incredible full instrumentation that was a Chrysler specific. In other words, you didn't just jump behind the driver's uh, seat and look at a big speedometer and a gas gauge. Chrysler made sure you had a gauge for every function so that you could monitor everything that was going on in the car. And that was really an imperial hallmark right until the end. Always full instrumentation, oil pressure, temperature, an amp meter so you knew what was going on with the electrical system, uh, and a temperature gauge. You didn't get an, a light popping on that said hot after the car, you know, moments before the car boiled over. You could see what was happening with all of the functions of the car all along. This car has a full leather interior, which is very rare. Most of them are cloth and leather. Uh, and this car, of course, is about 75% original, which is incredible as well. You're looking at a car with about 70,000 miles on it and that entire chrome-plated grill that you're staring at in this picture is all original chrome plating from Detroit from 1955. This particular car had some VIPs in it. Lee Iacocca rode in it when he went to the dealer show in Atlantic City uh, as uh, chairman of the board and president of uh, Chrysler Corporation. David and Julie Eisenhower rode in it uh, on their way to a book signing event. And uh, as many Chrysler Imperial aficionados know, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower used these cars in his administration and he had one almost identical to this except in limousine form uh, for his term uh, as President of the United States and it's currently at his farm in Gettysburg. Uh, not open for public view though. So um, the 55 Imperial is a really special car and uh, it really plays a big role in history, automotive history, for Chrysler Corporation. And as you'll see in some other Imperials that we're going to look at in generations three and four, Chrysler didn't stop with, in the, 19, with the 1955 model year incorporating engineering firsts in its automobiles. This is a 1964 Imperial Crown convertible. It's the very tail end of the second generation of Imperials as their individual make. That generation ran from 57 to 66, that's a long time, but during that period there were three different really basic bodies, 57, 8, and 9, and then 60 through 63, and finally 64, 5, and 6. They all share a 129-inch wheelbase, the same windshield and cowl uh, behind me where the vents and wipers rest, and the rest of the bodies changed back and forth through each of those three segments. 1957 and 1964 represent Imperial's two highest production years, and really the years that Chrysler put everything they could behind the cars. 1957 was really the um, second, second um, new body for the Imperial. Again, Virgil Exner's forward look. 1964 is a completely, totally different look by Elwood Engel, a new designer uh, for Chrysler, but he had come directly from Ford Motor Company, where he had come off the very successful design of the 61 Lincoln Continental, which originally was really designed as the 61 Thunderbird. Uh, the president of Ford Motor Company, Robert McNamara, later Secretary of Defense for President Kennedy, saw the uh, 61 proposal for the Thunderbird, liked it so much, had it stretched into a four-door, and it became the four-door Lincoln Continental. And then they rushed in with a quick 1961 Thunderbird, because now they had no design. Um, Engel was involved in both of those designs, uh, was passed over at Ford Motor Company for a promotion, and came to Chrysler, and was hired away by Lynn Townsend to head up Chrysler's styling section and he designed this stunning 64 Imperial, which looks very much like a Lincoln Continental. It has some very similar themes, but the theme that he was most known for was slab, the slab side school of design. So as you're looking at this car, this top chrome rail extends all the way forward to the front bumper, 
making the front grille recessed behind to a forward edge in the front fender. Same thing happens at the rear of the car. It's called slab side styling and it's edged in chrome trim. Uh, the difference is the Lincoln Continental when it's standing still looks like it's standing still. The 64 Imperial when it's standing still actually looks like it's leaning forward ready to pounce on its next victim. And uh, with the chromium steel torsion bar suspension, um, the uh, 350 horsepower uh, 413 V8 engine and Chrysler's torque flight, it really could pounce on anything because it's one powerful car and I have uh, several Imperials. This Imperial rides the best of any Imperial I have <clears throat> and that includes my Ghia limousine. So uh, the reason for that of course is as a convertible it has a structural cross member to strengthen the frame because it has no top as a convertible. So it has an incredible ride. It handles very smoothly. It has responsive acceleration. It has room for a family of 10 if you count the trunk. And um, it uh, is just a superb automobile. Um, 1964 represented their first marketing effort calling it the incomparable Imperial from 60 to 63, they advertised it as America's most carefully built automobile, which frankly was true. Uh, they're built on a very slow production line. Um, the attention to quality and detail was tremendous. Chrysler was very serious about making the very best car money could buy. Um, this was the largest production car in America, larger than a Lincoln, larger than a Cadillac, and it weighed more as well. Remember, this is a time when weight meant luxury. A heavier car meant a better riding car. A heavier car meant a better constructed car. A heavier car meant a car that was built out of superior materials. There's no plastic in this car. Um, the other thing about this car for 64, five and six, the uh, body mounts, this is a separate, this is Chrysler's last uh, body on frame car and Chrysler mounted them with rubber donuts between the body mounts and the car and the chassis to dampen road vibration and provide for a quieter, smoother ride. Uh, while a torsion bar suspension gives you a firmer, uh, more responsive handling ride than, for example, a Lincoln or a Cadillac with coil springs, um, Chrysler did everything they could do to separate you from all the little bumps and pitches in the road. And they did a magnificent job with it because really this car handles and drives uh, beautifully with very little yaw, very little pitch, no sway. And uh, in a convertible, of course, there's usually cal shake and shimmy. There's none of that present at all with this car. And when I say none, I mean zero. Uh, so uh, as a result, Chrysler was rewarded with their highest second sales year. In 1957, during Gen 2, they actually passed Lincoln Continental and the Lincoln division of Ford Motor Company um, in sales, uh, building just a few over 37,000 Imperials, their high water mark. Um, generally with convertible production, most years saw a total production run of about 500 for the Imperial convertibles. Some years a few more, some years a few less. I think the uh, last year was for 1968 for convertible production and they had a total, I think, of 422. Um, in uh, 1957, they passed 1,000 convertibles, uh, which is a big deal for Imperial production. 64. All 900 and I think uh, 50 or thereabouts was uh, the second high greatest year for Imperial production. So uh, it's a rare car, that's not a big number in Detroit, but for Imperial, it's a big, big year. The next best year, the third, third highest production year for Imperials in general as a make was 1969. And then after that, it trailed off to just a few cars over 10 or 12,000 each year until they ended production in 75. So, uh, uh, the color on this is a unique color. This is rosewood metallic, um, which is kind of a mauve shade and uh, was a night one year only color. And I think this car actually looks uh, 
frankly stunning in it. It's probably its nicest shade, but that's my opinion. Color keyed wheel covers. Um, the only year for that with Imperial as well. And I can only imagine the nightmare of trying to have those line up in a production line. And um, um, so if you're looking for a riding experience and driving experience of your life, I encourage you to at least go for a ride once in your life in a 64, five or six Imperial. This is a 1968 Chrysler Imperial Crown four-door hardtop. It's a great example of the fourth generation Imperial, which was just two model years, 67 and 68. One of the important points of this car is this is the first unibody generation. All of Chrysler Corporation cars went strictly unibody, which means it's a one piece welded body. It's not a body mated or bolted to a frame of a car in 1960 that was on all Chrysler lines, whether it was their full-size Chrysler New Yorker, Dodge, Monaco, Polara, Plymouth Fury, the mid-size line, or Dodge Dart and Plymouth Valiant. They were all unibody cars. The holdout was Imperial up until this generation. So this is a unibody car, but it rides on its own exclusive 127 inch Imperial only wheelbase for a better ride and a much heavier car. And remember, this is at a period of time that more weight meant a better ride. So they weren't trying to make the cars lighter. The more expensive the car, the heavier it was, the larger the V8 engine it was, etc. This car rides on chromium steel torsion bars for front suspension for an unparalleled smooth ride, but yet with road feel, unlike Cadillacs, Lincolns, etc. Um, it's powered by Chrysler's famous 440 V8 coupled to the Chrysler Torque Flight automatic transmission. Um, the difference on this car is that all of the 440s that went in, into Imperials were actually balanced and blueprinted unlike the regular run-of-the-mill 440 engine that you've got in every other Chrysler product, including motorhomes. Next, this car was actually banned from demolition derbies. And the reason it was is it has a full-frame cross member in front of the radiator support. So from the front forks of the frame, just behind the front bumper of this car, there's a full horizontal frame member, which makes it actually almost impossible to uh, either really frankly lose a demolition derby or lose any kind of accident in your local parking lot. So when you bought an Imperial, you were really protected. And that's before the five mile an hour bumpers. This is all behind the car, all things that you never saw. Inside the car, and you'll see this in a minute, is a series of gold looking panels and that's actually inlaid bronze. Chrysler was not playing around when they gave you a more expensive car. This is the only production car that ever had inlaid bronze panels on the interior. I'm not so sure the people buying the cars knew that, but that's the case. This particular car was a gift to the museum by a family in Norristown, Pennsylvania. The uh, husband was a actually an automobile mechanic by trade, so he knew what the best cars were. And he had saved all of his life and wanted a Chrysler Imperial. So this was his car and it never went out in the rain. And when I say it never went out in the rain, I mean never. His daughter got, was uh, set to be married. The morning he woke up for the wedding, it was raining outside and he told his wife they were taking the Dodge Dart to the wedding. And she said, oh no, we're not, we're taking the Imperial. So that was the only time I think it's ever been out in the rain. And it is just an exquisite car. The original hand buffed um, Chrysler enamel and uh, along with the original vinyl top and the original leather interior. And while we're on leather interiors, Imperials had a very specific leather that they used. It's much heavier. The seats are double padded and double sprung for comfort. So this is a seat that you can sit in and drive 3,000 miles and arrive without back pain. You're not tired, you've got excellent visibility, and you're really commander of the road. This is also the last year that Chrysler Imperial had its exclusive sheet metal from the greenhouse down. So the fenders, um, hood, uh, quarter panels, door, door hardware, uh, door handles, all of that Imperial only. So 
It's really a magnificent car and uh, hopefully someday you'll have the opportunity to at least ride in one if not drive one.